everyone. Welcome back to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. For many people, success means having it all and doing it all. But in her new book, Becoming Superwoman, New York Times bestselling author Nicole Lappin wants to end that idea. After her own struggle with a burnout, Lappin has created 12 steps to help readers find balance and success on their own terms. Please help me welcome Nicole Lappin. <laughs> Hey. Thank you, Brittany. It's yeah. so good to see you. How you doing? You're the ultimate superwoman. Oh my God, you're a superwoman. Thank you. But I don't think it, last time I saw you was on our Build Brunch show. You were helping me with money. So now I you're got you me with career. Whatever you need. Every I'm you like cross all boards. So the book comes out tomorrow. It does. How does that feel? You're excited? It's like crowning a baby. <laughs> Basically, I haven't had real babies. I'm just birthing. This is my third book a baby. So it's getting real. But you know, my girlfriends who have had books and babies say this one is harder. There's no epidural. Well, there's no paternal, and it, you pour, I feel like, a lot of your heart and soul in this book. It is a very, very, very honest book. It's uh, real. Yeah. yeah, and so I want to just uh, say thank you for that, because in reading it, I know it's hard to be vulnerable. I know it's hard to share your story while you're maybe still processing some of it. So um, I think fans of yours and new fans of yours will get to see a side of you that I think will be really refreshing. Was that thank something you. you wanted to do, was just make sure it was as honest as possible? The only no way I know how to tell a story is to tell it honestly. And uh, the topic of burnout and mental health, especially in the workplace, is still super taboo. And I've always gone by the philosophy, you remember, from rich bitch and boss bitch, when it comes to taboo subjects or things that are really embarrassing to talk about, then I go first. So I kind of say, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Or you don't have to show me yours. <laughs> Just show yourself yours, at least if you feel more comfortable talking about it. Right. And you dedicated this book to the old you, basically. Why? My former self thought that she would never get to the other side of happiness or balance. You know, we're always in this constant cycle that we think we'll be happy or balanced when we get there, right? A certain job or a certain salary. And then we get there. And I don't know if you were like me, but almost immediately there's another there, there. We keep changing the goalpost on ourselves. So I never got my brain to the other side, but she never thought she would. And now I know that that equation is wrong. It's actually that happiness and balance will bring you more success and not the other way around. Absolutely. But it takes a lot of work and it maybe takes actually burning out to realize that. And so you talk a lot about a breakdown you had. Can you tell us a little bit about when that happened and what that experience was like, how scary that was? I had um, an emotional, mental, and physical breakdown after a severe burnout. And it all happened after the launch of my second book, Boss Bitch. And some people are saying to me now, like, are you okay? You're going on another book tour. Like, is everything okay? And I say it wasn't that book tour. It wasn't a spontaneous combustion precipitated by a Single event, but a lifetime of smoldering embers that finally caught fire and incinerated everything in their path. And I say that almost poetically because it's in the book and I've thought a lot about how that happened. And for a long time, I self-prescribed work to myself. It wasn't drugs or alcohol, but I had a very tumultuous childhood, a ton of childhood trauma that I didn't even know I was hiding from by working and then working some more. But ultimately, it kicked my butt. And that's when I had to rethink everything. I had an emergency admittance to the psych ward, and I was on top of the world from all outward appearances. I was this New York Times bestselling author that was teaching other women how to get their financial and career lives together. I looked really put together on the outside, but I wasn't as put together on the inside as I looked. And when I got to my own personal rock bottom, I realized that that's when everything needed to change, how I was working, how I approached my career. And at that moment is when I realized that self-care is the biggest asset or liability in your career, to throw out some business terms for you. But it's true. I would talk about networking your booty off. I would talk about emailing in the middle of the night and all these tactics for negotiating and getting ahead. But nothing affected my career more than that. And that's when I realized that when it's off, it can bring you down to your personal rock bottom. And when it's on point, it can bring you more success than you ever imagined. So did you start working on this book after that experience? 
So is that what kind of ignited this shift for you? I actually had sold a different book. Okay. And I said, that's actually not going to be authentic. And if I'm going through this, I know that my readers are smart. And they know when something really is a topic I'm passionate about and something that it's not. And I try to stick to the former and not the latter. You know, when I left Network News, I could all of a sudden tell these sort of taboo topics and go first. And it gave other women license to open up about their stories. And I found that to be really powerful. So I said no to that book that I actually signed a contract for. And I switched gears. And I didn't expect this topic, because I sold this two and a half years ago, to be so zeitgeisty as it is now. The World Health Organization has named it a condition. It's something that people want to talk about. And I say. I'll go first. Yeah. And we see, like you said, that idea and that conversation around self-care in every women's magazine, on every blog. I mean, it is something that, like you said, is so widespread. So many women are trying to find that balance. And one of the tips you give in the book is about kind of literally and figuratively engaging with yourself, getting engaged to yourself, choosing yourself first. Is that what? Oh, hey. Oh, hi. Yeah, I literally put a ring on it. This is my right hand. <laughs> I mean, maybe one day I'll get a ring on the other hand, but even still, I think it's always important to literally I put a ring on myself because I love four letter words, as you know. Um, you know, self has become my favorite one, but it took a long time. You know, I think from the beginning, it was a solo journey. Uh, when I left the hospital, I knew that I needed to get down with that on day one. And not only did I need to put a ring on myself, but I needed to like the person I saw in the mirror. And I really didn't, if we're being honest. And I would talk so badly to myself. I had a, I I felt like I had a mean girl inside my head and I had to quiet her. I didn't really know how. And that's why I set out on this journey because I wanted to break this down in the same way as I do my other books in 12 steps with brass tacks, with real actionable advice, not this woo woo stuff. I wanted to know exactly how to do this because you're right in the women's magazines, it says like, love yourself, go on your own solo journey, like meditate. I'm like, what? I have so many questions about this. Is meditation like where you pay 40 bucks and sit in silence? Like. What am I missing? And so I went out to try and hack happiness, productivity. And yeah, putting a ring on it was a foreign concept to me. And now I say to my girlfriends when they talk bad about themselves, like they'll say, I look so bad or I, you know, I messed up at work. I'm never going to get another job. I'm going to die alone in the gutter. I'm like, stop talking about my friend like that. Yeah. Right? If somebody else talked about you like that, I would punch them in the face and gouge their eyes out. Thank you, Nicole. You're not allowed to talk about my friend like that. I mean, we talk so badly to ourselves in a way that we would never talk to our best friends. Well, that's what you talk about um, because, like, we've all had ups and downs. And I know in one of my kind of lulls, my cousin said, start a gratitude journal because you don't feel like anything is going well in your life. But when you start writing it down every day, you see all of the joy that there is around you. And that's one of the tips that you mentioned in the book. And uh, I just think that's so important for more people to do because it does sort of rewire your brain. It totally does. And I know that it sounds cheesy, but I feel the difference when I don't I, do a gratitude I, I journal in the morning. I 100% am with you. I was running out the door this morning. We're doing all sorts of different appearances. I have like 14 dresses in the car. And I was like, <gasps> I saw my gratitude journal on the counter. And I was like, you have to take one minute and do this. And it's going to change your day. And I know that my day is chaotic, as is yours, as is all of ours. But if I can keep my morning and evening routines sacred that I know the rest of the hours are going to be a lot better yeah. and it's the little things like that that make all the difference truly I agree it's the little things um and in your book you quote uh Gloria Steinem yeah girl Superwoman is the adversary of the women's movement and that kind of ties in with that idea of having it all and what does that mean and how do you do it and I love in the book that you sort of encourage people to break their lives down into these different areas and to come up with like one year, three year, five year plan. So you don't feel like you have to do everything right now. Well, at least not at once. Yeah. We can have it all. I truly believe we can have it all because that's the age old question for women. I just don't think we can do it all. And the only way to have it all is to define what it all means and stop changing the goalpost on yourself because we compare ourselves to the best version of all different areas of our lives. We compare our fitness regime to that of a fitness blogger. We compare how we are as a mom to that of a mom who homeschools her kids and bakes bread for them every day. 
that's just not realistic. Those women don't have the same set of circumstances that we do. And so when Gloria said superwoman is the adversary of the women's movement, she said superwoman the character, which is the one word version, who tries to do it all and be it all and be all things to all people. So ultimately she's nothing to herself. I don't want to be that kind of woman. I want to be a super space woman. Hello, <laughs> Nicole's face uh, in big version. Um, but you can take this home with you. <laughs> Thank <anyway>. you. <laughs> There's a space there right around my legs um, that's really intentional. And that space allows for you, the woman, to put her oxygen mask on first before helping others. They don't say that on the plane, of course, before takeoff just to waste time. That's true. You can't be of service to anyone else if you're crashing and burning yourself. And that's so, I mean, I'm single, I don't have kids, and so it's easy for me to to have that mindset. But I think it's so important for especially mothers to, like, not be vilified if they take some time for themselves. I don't know how we switch up that narrative, but it seems super detrimental. I did a social experiment last weekend when I was in LA starting the book tour, and I asked women to come in for a casting. And I had them write on a little whiteboard the top five things they value in the world. And they wrote all sorts of things. They wrote my house, my job, my car, my dog, food, God, whatever. And none of them wrote themselves on the list. They turned it around and I said, where are you on the list? I mean, I don't know about all y'all, but would you even think to put yourself on the list? And I think therein lies the real danger. You know, I'm single like you. And for so many years, I would think, gosh, I'll be happy when I get married and have a family, then my life will really start. Then I'll start taking adventures, then I'll go on trips. And then I was waiting, and then I was waiting, and then I was tired of waiting. And I realized that when I needed a hero most, I had to become one. Yeah. I mean, you only have one life to live, you might as well start living it now, for sure. Like that whole idea of waiting for something, I think is super universal. Have you and ever gone to a movie by yourself? Oh, I do everything by myself. I yeah. was obsessed, I was like, wait, 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 how did I do this before. It's awesome. Actually, you don't need somebody to go to the movies with you. Breaking news. Because you're watching something. You heard it here first. Yeah, it's fantastic. Right. Or like I've traveled by myself. Same. Yeah. I eat meals by myself. Yeah. I think it's actually, it may, I, you get to know yourself and a lot of people don't do that work. Yeah, it's literally the only person you will be with till death do you part. And so. It's heavy. It's, it's real heavy. <laughs> it's as heavy as the rock that I put on my finger. <laughs> Uh, I think one reason it's so hard for people is because of social media. And you talk in the book about uh, the impact that a digital detox had on you. So why was that something that you wanted to challenge yourself to do? Game changer. Um, when I left the hospital, I took all the social media apps off my phone. And I'm lucky enough to have help on social media. But I know that even just a few hours off social media was a total, totally changed my life. I mean, I had chronic hives for the longest time. I didn't even know where they came from. I went to all sorts of allergy doctors. I had all sorts of antihistamines. When I got off my phone, they almost all went away. And I think that being on social media constantly, the first thing when I woke up in the morning, we talked about the morning and evening routine. It just took over what I had in mind for my day. It took over my intentions, right? Because all of a sudden, when you check your phone the first thing in the morning, like you're responding to emails, you're firefighting, and you go down other people's agendas, and you don't set your own. And then it will be 30 minutes later, and you've checked your texts and your emails, and then you've gone to Tinder or whatever, and you've gone to Instagram, and then you've gone back to your text, and then you've gone to Instagram and found your ex-boyfriend's cousin's dog's page, and you're like, what? is happening. Or even at night, you know, when I really put boundaries around my time on my phone at night, I could sleep. It was crazy. I was like on this sleeping pill cycle. And when I didn't hold my phone two centimeters away from my eye, it felt like at times, it was crazy how all of a sudden I could sleep some more. But how long do you think it took you to get used to that, like not having it in your hand all the time? It felt like a total withdrawal. Yeah. It felt like I was coming off an addiction, and that's really what it was. There's a word for phone addictions. We touch our phones 80 times a day. Right? We don't do anything 80 times a day. We don't go to the bathroom 80 times a day. We don't smile 80 times a day. We touch our phones 80 times a day and they have used to been the thing that served us and now we serve our phones. You know, we used to have a calculator and a camera. Who has a calculator? I mean, for real, like nothing, we don't need I don't even have a anymore. flashlight anymore. 
You don't need a flashlight. It's on my phone. Light. Right. <laughs> and so I got an old school alarm clock too. It really was a game changer as well. I know it sounds so basic, but they make those still. And watches, by the way, also tell time. Who knew? They're not just a fashion statement. Mine don't actually. The batteries are dead. <laughs> I just wear them as fashion <laughs> accessories. But I, I hear your bigger point. Yeah. Um, it's about setting those boundaries, right? So whether it's with your technology or even with your friends and family, which I really love this chapter. I'm a huge fan of healthy boundaries um, because people love to suck your energy. And a lot of the times you're not aware of it until you get home and you've got nothing left to give. So I love also in the book, you give people examples of how to set those boundaries, how to say no, because I think it's something that's really hard to do and learn. It's so important. And you remember this from my previous books too. I gave scripts because in theory, people know like, oh, I should negotiate. But I'm like, how do you do that? So here is like a step-by-step -step actual script that you can follow. So yeah, I do the same thing for boundaries because it's hard to say no. And you're right. People will suck your energy if you let them. You can't pour from an empty cup. Right? So you, you have to make sure that you're putting yourself first on the top of that to-do list and not feel like that's selfish a bad thing because the definition of selfish also includes taking care of yourself, which I think should be a compliment, not a diss. For women, selfless is considered a compliment, and I think that should be considered a diss. But when you're setting boundaries, you know, countries, states have boundaries. They're not wishy-washy, they're clear. And so when you say somebody has crossed the line, that's creating a boundary. But you don't need to know exactly where that line is. Like if you're at work, you could be very cool with doing your boss's kids science fair project. I don't care, you do you. Or you could not be, but you have to define that for yourself. And remember that no, as Superwoman Shonda Rhimes says, is a complete sentence. And it's starting to reframe the idea of saying no to other people is actually saying yes to yourself. And if you're trying to be helpful to other people, as you feel bad saying no, and especially for women, we're like, but this could be the last opportunity I get. This could be the last thing I do. I will never get this again. And that's that scarcity, mean girl mentality. And I think it's about, you know, really reframing that idea to say, if I'm not doing an amazing job for this person, if I really don't have the bandwidth, then I'm not being of service to them. And although boundaries are important, community is also. And so I love that you sort of wrap everything up by saying that you need to find the people uh, that can support you on your journey. Is that something that helped you through when you were coming back and trying to find Nicole again? Or sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. Yeah, it was like I just I, have a cape for on. For I said it, don't it worry. Was like laughing, <laughs> but like okay, like making it happen. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I am a great member of the tribe. And remember, you have to be the member of a tribe because if you want people who are loyal and honest and all these things that we all want from our community or our, or our squad, then you have to sometimes put down the magnifying glass and look in the mirror. Are you those things yourself? Because you're part of whatever club you are a member of. And so I think really think of your community as your own personal C-suite. You know, a C-suite of a company is all the folks with the C in the title. So chief executive officer, chief financial officer, and really think about who is in yours. And just because you grew up with those people doesn't automatically give them a golden ticket into your crew. Yeah. You know. Uh, studies have shown that you need two out of three qualities to create sustaining relationships, shared history, shared values, and equality. So if somebody is just somebody that you went to middle school with, but you have nothing in common with and sucks all your energy and is not equal, then that's not, that's not a friend. That's a freeloader. <laughs> so, um, so it's about really defining for who you are now. And what I did when, when I was in a really great place is I created a list of all the people that I had in different cities. I broke them down by cities. And I looked back when I was traveling and I was like, these are the safe folks. And I know that that's my handwriting. When I was like yeah. in a good space, those are the people that I can call and hang out with. It's so important. And like you said, I think we all know that as you get older, that group gets a little smaller, but more special. And that's okay. Yeah, I think so. And then uh, we do have a couple of questions. I would love that. Uh, who do we have first? Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering what the biggest lesson you learned in your 20s that you apply to your 30s now. So I think, what's your name? 
Delaney. Hey, Delaney. I'm Nicole. Um, and so I think when I look back at my 20s, I worked so, so, so much. And I don't actually regret that because it made me who I am today. It made me be able to sit here with Brittany and Delaney and everybody to have this platform. So I knew that balance was going to look different at different times. And so I think it's about not beating yourself up for what you're not focusing on. So in your 20s, if you want to focus on your career, focus on your career and don't shame yourself for it because balance can be used as a noun and a verb, not to get all semantics and grammarian here, but I really think of it as a verb. It's something that you constantly have to work on. It's not like, oh, hey, I found balance. It's right there under the couch. I'm like, what is this game of hide and seek role playing that I don't know about? And so I think it's really about knowing that perhaps in your 20s, like, that's okay. And I used to be so mad at myself. I was like, but I don't have balance. What's like, what does that actually mean for me and not everyone else? And stop changing the definition because I think that we constantly, again, compare ourselves to other people. When people come to me and they say, I'm not balanced, I'm like, did you even have a definition of balance? Or like, I'm off budget. I'm like, did you even have a budget? So first define what those terms mean to you and be okay with that being your own personal definition. And maybe in your 30s, that's not going to be you. You're not going to be at your desk for 10 hours a day and that's okay too. So yeah, I created this sort of Weight Watcher system where you can give yourself points throughout the day. I hate this whole work-life balance and I would have told my 20-year-old self to chill with that. It's not Lady Justice with her two stupid bowls. It's not. I mean, do you have just two things you're juggling, Delaney? Or do you have like a side hustle, a romance, and uh, what is that, 37%? Like, how can you do that? And so I give 10 points and say, pick five of the things you value the most. You have to give one to your own emotional wellness. That's my only requirement. Otherwise, it will require all of the points. And if you really love percentages, I know you do, you just add a zero sneak attack, and that becomes a percentage. So I think that's a better way to look at balance. So I would have told my 20-year-old self that. Thank you. I think, too, in your 20s, I would have loved to tell myself just to be kinder to myself. Yeah. It's everything you just yeah. said of, like, the weird pressures you put on yourself and you're in competition with yourself so often. And it's like, just be kind to yourself. You're doing the best you can do. Totally. Yeah. And you're doing the best you can do with the information you have now. And even if you learned all these great things, which, by the way, you and I talked about this before, like, I wish we taught financial literacy in school. You know, we learn the most ridiculous things in school. Geometry, like, who needs to know that? Who who is using that right now? Because I'm not, right? Why? Or, yes, yeah, the graphing calculator thing. Just use the one on your phone and yeah. go in a day. I need to understand, <laughs> like, percentages on credit cards, a not med, or Right, or how to do a budget or our taxes or business plan. Way more helpful. But also these emotional skills, we don't learn them in school either. And so when you do become, you know, more versed in balance and what that looks like for you, that's okay. You know, you're doing the best you can right now with the information you have. Next question. Hi, do you have a specific quote from your new book that you go back to the most? That I can be a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. It's one of the things in my gratitude journal that I actually write. Um, you write like a mantra for the day, and that's shown up in the most for me. Yeah. Also, everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Yeah. I love quotes. Who doesn't love a good I do theme? love quotes. Hi. But that is so true, and, and that's why I want to thank you again for sharing your journey, because I think so many people have seen you on TV and in social media, and we all like to think other people's lives are perfect, and I always really applaud the people who are brave enough to stand in their truth and share their journey in the hopes of helping other people, you know? And so I, I really want people to check out this book, and thank you again for writing it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Coming through the fire, tried to bring back some buckets of water for yes. the other folks. <laughs> you did. Still in the flames. I get it. Thank you, you so much, Brittany. Yeah, and you guys can buy Becoming Super Woman. It's available tomorrow wherever books are sold. And put your hands together for Nicole Appen. Thank you.